We're going to get started. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming, especially on a holiday weekend, sharing your holiday weekend with us. Um, so um, welcome all our members, um, new members, guests. Do we have anybody here for the first time? <laughs> How many years? Five or six years. Can, can you tell us your name, sir? Thank you for coming now. What brought you back after so many years? Oh, oh, well, we're sorry about the circumstance, but we're glad that you're here now. And Mr. Tully, thank you. And thank you for this nice, uh, I understand that you are now the um, president of the, the community club. So we, we thank you for, for a new home. And yes, and former mayor. Any other new faces, people um, we haven't seen before? Thank you. All right, um, housekeeping for those people who are uh, joining us online. Um, we're going to mute everybody's mics so to cut down on uh, extra noise. Uh, after uh, the presentation, we'll take some questions from the floor, and we're going to ask Tim to uh, to repeat the questions so everybody hears, including the people online. Um, people online can use the chat feature, uh, the Zoom chat feature, to send in questions, and we'll try our best to ask uh, have, um, satisfy everybody's curiosity. Uh, people to remember: we've already lost two important members this year, uh, Rod Howarth. Uh, pillar of our boat crew and uh, a great volunteer at, at Waterloo, and uh, Lou will be, um, he, he will be sorely missed. And just, just recently, uh, Earl Post, our carpenter, passed away. And uh, many years he worked with us at Waterloo, make all kinds of uh, wonderful things for our, our exhibits. Um, he was in ill health. We haven't had him with us at Waterloo for a couple of years now, and uh, he just recently passed away. Yes, the dashboard, things for our boat exhibit. So we, we will miss both of those people. Um, Greenway News, um, the lock restoration project at uh, Wharton, lock number two east. You saw the panels up there in the back. Is, the project is still moving forward, uh, not quite as fast as we would uh, anticipate. Um, they're talking about having at least a partial dedication on uh, Water, Wharton Canal Day. So keep your fingers through us and, and we'll see how that, how that progresses. I try to visit every week to see how they're doing. Uh, the restoration work at Plain 2 in, uh, in Ledgewood uh, is delayed. They've decided they're going to do work on the dam that uh, creates the pond between the two inclined planes there. And uh, that's been moving along, but it's not finished yet. So they can't do one project and like finish another one. Other Greenway project the Canal Society is involved in this year. We're working with Montville Township to do signage at, at Dorsey's Pond. Uh, we're working at Griffith Park in Booton Township, for more signage uh, at uh, the uh, at at, uh, at Powerville, the uh, the home of the, of the Scott family, deeply involved in canal history. Um, and Warren County, we're doing uh, working with them uh, at Plain Six West and at Redlock Park. Uh, with projects and uh, also uh, in Newark, we've got something lined up at, uh, um, at, at Long Lock Street near NGIT. So lots and lots of things, lots and lots of projects are doing. Um, events coming up, uh, Waterloo Canal Day is going to be next weekend. Yeah, it is. So June the 4th. So hopefully some of you will join us. Um, Shortly thereafter, uh, Warren uh, County Park Fest on June 11th, and then uh, Wharton Canal Day uh, on August the, the 20th. So we're going to be really, really busy. Hopefully, you folks will join us for at least one of those festivals. Have a good time. Um, we sent out uh, ballots to all uh, you members, hopefully, many of you voted. We got a big pile of ballots. I think the voting will. 
uh, is scheduled to be done on the 31st. So if you haven't voted, please do now. Cast a vote. And um, let's see. Uh, volunteers. Um, I guess Bobby is not here tonight, our volunteer coordinator, but uh, we need volunteers to help with our programming at Waterloo and our uh, upcoming programming at Lock 2. So um, if you're not, um, some time, if you have some time to be with us, we mostly need people to, to greet the public. You don't need to be an expert. You don't need to be a skilled interpreter. Um, it's actually a lot of fun. So if you have some time to, to join us and, um, and meet and greet the public, please talk to us about it and uh, we'd be glad to, to have you. Okay, some new breaking news. Uh, we've talked a lot about our archives lately. We've done a lot to get them organized. Uh, John Prytow, one of our new board members, has done uh, an amazing amount of work getting our collection organized. It's grown exponentially over the years. And it's been in many locations, most of them not good. I remember years ago, um, most of our collection was under Bill Moss's table, his kitchen table, actually. Not a good situation. After that, it was moved to a church basement, a little bit better. And uh, then to Phillipsburg, train station in Phillipsburg in the basement there. And so each step growing larger and larger. Recently, we've had it in two storage areas in Hackettstown and um, two absolutely packed storage areas. And so um, that was a good place to keep it and it was safe, but we absolutely cannot do anything in the kind of room that we were we were dealing with. So just recently, we've taken another step forward and uh, we are actually acquiring space uh, office slash archive space. So this is a big step for us and uh, um, it's ongoing now. It's uh, going to take quite a long time to get everything moved, everything organized, but uh, stay tuned. In the near future, it will take a couple of months to get it ready for prime time, but when it is, uh, there'll be a big announcement and there will be a, a ribbon cutting and uh, you all will be invited. Uh, tonight, we have a great presentation. Uh, our Vice President, uh, Tim Roth, will be talking about Stanhope. This Stanhope is a great place. It's uh, uh, one of the best preserved iron industry slash canal towns in, the, um, in, in North Jersey. It's one of those little tiny places that you don't really recognize or have appreciation for until you kind of begin to savor it. So, Tim. Okay, thank you all for coming. Let me just adjust the camera a little bit because I want to stand up here where I can see my screen. And Jeff, too. So I, I want to start out first of all and, and thank our tech team. Jeff, who's my left, and I'm sorry, Ken is on my left, and Jeff over here. Um, yeah, we were during COVID, we were doing all virtual meetings and then things kind of got back to normal. And we got feed, I got feedback, so I got a lot of the communication through the website. And they were both very passionate on both sides. There were people who said, we have to return in-person meetings now. And then there were people who said, no, virtual is great. I live down in Florida. I live out in California and I don't like the, or you know, people live in the area, but they don't like to drive at night and they like the virtual. So we are trying to do both. We have all you folks here in person and we have or folks online who are watching this virtually, this is very difficult to do. In fact, I had a person from another historical society call me up and said, I hear you do both virtual and, and in person. How do you do this? And I walked through this whole tactical setup to do this. And when I thought it through in my head, very, very complicated. So can we give a hand to Jeff and uh, Ken for this and online? Okay, presentation tonight, uh, Stanhope. Stanhope is always fascinating me because it is a 21st century village. But if you go in there, it's really not much different from how it was 100, 150 years ago during the canal era. The Morris Canal, of course, had very uh, big, big, big impact on its development and everything that went on there. And we're gonna walk, go through, we're gonna follow the uh, canal through Stanhope. We're gonna look at a lot of different 
things in Stanhope, uh, old buildings and, and places and industry that was there. Um, and we're also going to show you a lot of what's there today to see. Now, if you see this presentation today and it piques you in your interest, Joe is doing a heritage walk in Stanhope June 25th. So if you see all this and you say, wow, I want to go out and, and see this for myself, um, doing the walk with Joe, you'll learn a lot. He'll go through a lot of um, what I, I'm going through tonight, but he'll also go through things that I don't go through because he and I kind of do things differently, different emphasis and, and so on. Joe and Beers. Joe and Beers. Beers will be there too. Okay, so we're going to... Okay, this is not working. Uh, let's see, I see my laser point's working. Bear with us. I guess I can just do this. It'll work, huh? Yeah. I can do which button here is it? Well, you can use the uh, down arrow. And arrow. Okay. Hey, bear with us, folks. This week, it was working just you a minute ago. Okay, so I can use the mouse. Yeah, unfortunately, this was working. In our point. now it's working for some reason. Uh, okay, we'll see how it goes. Um, there we go. <clears throat> All right, we're going to start looking at a couple maps here. This map is stand open 1835. So this is right after the canal open. You can see the uh, canal running through the town. And this gives us a, a good indication of what Stanhope looked like before the canal. And basically what it was, was just a crossroads. We have four different roads here, road to Elizabethtown, road to Flanders, road to Newton, and the road to Brooklyn. Now Brooklyn is the area that we know today of as uh, Hepakon Borough. The uh, reason it got that name is there's a forge. If you know where Packham State Park is, that was the location of a forge. It was called Brooklyn Forge. The area became known as Brooklyn. And over the years, that got corrupted to Brooklyn, like the New York borough, and the area became known as Brooklyn. Packham Borough is actually incorporated originally as Brooklyn, and they changed it probably because it caused a lot of confusion. Um, but we still have that today. If you go from State Park to uh, Stanhope, what are you driving? Brooklyn Stanhope Road. So we still see that name. Back then it was Brooklyn. Um, but there was not a lot in Stanhope here. Few uh, buildings, houses, little bit of industry. And I'll point you to one right here in the corner of the road to Brooklyn. That building we're gonna see throughout this whole presentation. We're gonna see it was there at the incorporation of Stanhope. It's there today, you probably know what it is. I won't say it yet. But that's been the mainstay of Stanhope, is that one building there. Now, let's jump ahead five years, Stanhope 1840. Now things have changed. Before, we didn't have a Main Street. Now we have a Main Street. They've kind of reconfigured the road from Elizabeth. Um, there's a little more industry there. We got Forge, we got a sawmill, we have a tannery over there. We have a few stores here. And we have this uh, a house that's called El. RP Bell. We'll talk about that a little bit later. What don't you see here? Well, we don't see Lake Musconetcong, which is on the eastern border of Stanhope. And that's because it didn't exist yet. Even though uh, Musconetcong is this Native American word, the natives never saw that lake. It was created for the Moores Canal. So back then, it was just the Musconetcong River winding its way into Stanhope. And here's the canal going right through, it was a swampy area that the canal um, went through there. So it wasn't until five years later that this lake was created. It was originally called Stanhope Reservoir. So what happened is the Moores Canal was open in 1831. Within 10 years, it was pretty much obsolete as it was first designed. Uh, cargo demand was growing crazy. We were now in the industrial revolution. We needed more boats, more cargo, bigger boats. So we needed a bigger canal. Canal was widened, the locks were widened and the inclined planes were totally redesigned instead of using big water wheels. It was now the Scotch reaction turbines with enormous amount of water comes down and turns these turbines underwater. So this all required more water. So we had Lake Opacon, which was main uh, reservoir. They needed another one on the Eastern side 
So they dammed the uh, Muskrekong River there and created Stanhope Reservoir. And that was its first purpose as a reservoir for the Morris Canal. Uh, of course, after a while, you know, many years, the canal was abandoned and it, uh, na its name was changed to Lake Muskrekong since it was a dam portion of the Muskrekong River. So ironically, you got, uh, the, you know, Hapakong and Muskrekong, both Native American uh, words, but both lakes were created really by European immigrants uh, for the Moores Canal. The natives never saw, natives never saw uh, Bear Pond, Cranberry Lake, Greenwood Lake, all bodies of water created for the Moores Canal. Now, since then, there's been many, many different additional reservoirs created in Northern New Jersey, you know, Spruce Run, Round Valley, Mill Creek, all of you, know, I'm a big kayaker, so I've been on all of them. But it's funny, you look at an 18th century map, very few inland bodies of water in northern New Jersey. Now you look at a uh, satellite photo, they're everywhere. So that's it's kind of, um, you know, most of them were man-made. Okay, so the boats had to get across uh, this new reservoir and they came down, this is uh, plane one west. So this was the first inclined plane on the western side of the canal. Port Morris was uh, west of Lake Opac and it was a summit level. So it descended the, from summit level down to Lake Muskrekon. And then there was a towpath that went across the lake. There was a towpath that originally they had to add to it to build it up. So it was after over lake level. So here we have a, a couple images. There you see going conning around the bend there. This photo is coming around that bed heading west towards Stanhope. And then here's a really good photo. The two mule teams, a white and a dark colored one pulling um, canal boats. but that's that's how they got across uh, Lake Muskinacon as few uh, this towpath. Now people always ask, is the towpath still there? Is it there buried underwater? Yes. Now if you look at satellite images, you will see the towpath underneath the water there going across the lake. But certain times when the lake is really low, it appears. And this was one of those times. This is a photo I shot not November nineteenth, two thousand sixteen. Story was I was driving home that day from the Lake of Pacon area on Central Avenue. Um, I looked over across Lake Muskie, Lake Mus it was beautiful fall day, crystal blue. And there was a towpath there. So being you know, crazy Moors Canal enthusiast, I ran home, threw my kayak in the car, drove back to the lake and <clears throat> paddled out there just so I could stand on this towpath. It allowed me to uh, create this then and now. This is the towpath heading east towards uh, Plane one west going up to Port Moores. Here's the exact same view, and plane one west would be right here next to this house there. But so if you ever, you know, hear that the lake is being lowered down, you will be able to see the towpath. And if you like me, you can go out there and actually stand on it. Other times, it's, you, maybe you see just little rocks emerging. But you know, this one day there it was at least part of it was. Okay, so uh, over, over on the Stanhope side. <clears throat> we have guard lock one west, first lock on the western side. Guard lock is used when you're going from one body of water back into the canal. The word guard means you're guarding the flow of water into the canal because you have to uh, control the level of the canal of the exact uh, depth of five feet. Um, so typically I will say that when you're moving from across a body of water from one side to another, there's three things you need. Uh, first, you need a dam to create slack water right here. That's, you know, the dam that created the lake. You need uh, a bridge or a path of some kind for the mules and the driver. And we already talked about that. And you need a guard lock. Now, typically that's the case. We're going to see a little bit that it's not always the case. And that's something that surprised me. <clears throat> now, um, here in the lower photo, this really good photo, this is the mule path. There's the lock there, Tender's house. And you got this big ice cutting operation. So many, many places on a canal where you had uh, bodies of water, they would do ice cutting in the winter. And this was back before uh, refrigeration electricity. So you cut blocks of ice because everyone had an ice box and that's how you kept your foods cold. Your bad butter, your milk, your eggs is through box of ice. So big industry, many places um, in the Moors Canal, uh, Dover, Port Murray, uh, booting at the um, dam portion of the uh, Rockaway River. Waterloo, of course, had a big ice cutting operation. Lake Opac had a number of 
ice cutting houses. So this was very common and since uh, Lake Musconecton was a, a big body of water, they did ice cutting here too. Okay, so he, these are photos from the other side uh, of Lock One West, top one. You're looking under the bridge. This was at the time called the Moore's Turnpike. Today, this would be 183, it goes one right through Stanhope. We see the lock, we see the tender's house. And then this view is taken from the bridge, looking down on the lock. Um, we see the tender kind of sitting there, hanging out. We see a boy on a bicycle, it might've been his son. But photos of the Moore's Canal are mostly uh, early 20th century, very late in the canal's history. Wasn't a lot of traffic. So probably this would be, you know, what a tender would be doing most days is just hanging out, waiting for a boat to come up. Uh, he has a little hut here. That's where you go if it starts to rain or, uh, you know, gets inclement weather. Uh, but that was Lock 1 West. Now, today, um, Lock's still there. You can see it. This uh, section of land on Lake Muskrakong is uh, part of State Park land. And there are the capstones of Lock 1 West. You can see extending right out to the water. <clears throat> In the bottom, here's an aerial photo. Here's the lock. You can see the wing walls going out to the lake. And uh, here's a watered section of the canal. Here's where that bridge would be today, right where 183 is. So um, there's the lock. You could see it. And then if just crossed 183, you come to one of the two watered section of the canal that exists in uh, Stanhope Village. And this is a uh, section that went along right between the towpath there and Main Street on your right. And today we got that exact same view. We saw the path, we saw the main street, but it doesn't go very long. It comes to uh, this section here. And then there's a drainage weir that drains in, into the uh, Muskrakong River, which is right over here. So we have just a small little section of water canal, but you know, it's very rare in the Morris Canal. Uh, if you get to the east side of this section, you can see you've got this brick house that's reflecting in a canal there. Well, that house has been reflecting in the canal for 187 years, because that is the Bell Mansion. And that's what we saw back in that 1840 map, R.P. Bell. Robert P. Bell uh, was the president at the time, Moore's Canal Bank Company. He had uh, a Ford and a mill right there in Stanhope. So he built this big house up on a hill. He could watch everything. He could watch his canal operation. He could watch his forage in his mill. He had this, a uh, commanding view from up top of the, the hill there. And there's a great 19th century photo with a horse and carriage back probably when he lived there. Uh, he owned it until 1905. And then a gentleman named Her Herbert Salmon owned it. 72 uh, years up until 1977 when he died at the age of 99. So after that, the house sat in rack and ruin for a number of years, you could see it there. But then fortunately in 2006, Someone bought it and we uh, stored it. And now it's this beautiful Bell Mansion restaurant. So if you're in Stanhope, you can have your dinner there. They have a nice patio outside and you can sit there and look out over the canal and over you know, Stanhope and all the different sites that used to be there. Um, this, the Bell Mansion, by the way, the restaurant were the ones who um, let me use these two historic photos. So I thank him for that. Okay, so here we now we see the uh, Morris Canal coming into Stanhope. Uh, here's the water section of the canal. We're starting to see buildings there. Uh, today, this is after the water section ends. So we have a basketball court and then we have uh, all municipal parking. <clears throat> That's typically what you see in the where canal sections that went through villages. When, they, when they, the canal was abandoned, they paved it over and they put parking there. So Joni Mitchell, they paved Paradise and put on a parking lot. They also also paved paradise or paved the canal and uh, put up a parking lot, and that's because when the canal was banned in the 1920s, that's when autos were really taken off. Every family had a car, so you know they needed places to park in these villages. So a lot of people like me, when you go into these places to uh, explore the canal sections, you parking right there in the canal. Stanhope, Booton, Rockaway, Little Falls, so it's same you know same like that. They're all parking. Um, this building here that you see, that was a tannery. It was the Stanhope Tannery, originally located farther east. We saw an 1840 map. Today, it's still there. It's, it's all, it's private apartments now, so you can't go in it, but they do have a sign there. It says tannery and 
So we know that it was a tannery. So that's good. Push a little bit farther uh, along the canal, we come to the Stanhope uh, Basin. So two buildings we see here. This is John Hall's store. That was a, a canal store. It served both the canal and the village. So it was a very uh, popular and successful store. And then over here was the uh, Stanhope Plaster Mill. That was a plaster mill that existed since the early 1800s. And they originally used it to make gypsum. Well, what was gypsum used for in relation to the canal? They used to plug holes uh, in boats. So probably some of the gypsum in this uh, plaster mill was used on the canal. Today, that uh, basin is now Stanhope Post Office. Because it's post office, all the postal cars lined up there. Uh, so that's what they did to it. Uh, if you go here, the ruins of the plaster mill were just over to the left here. Now, if you go here today and just go around the corner, you'll come to a second watered section of canal in Stanhope. And that was this Moore's Canal Spur. And Joe will probably be taking you on it if you go on his um, hike. And you can follow a little way through the woods here. And then it comes to this big basin. And this was a, an outlet off the canal. And this was there to reserve the Muscadet Gong Iron Works. So this was the big industry in Stanhope. This was very instrumental in the development of uh, Stanhope. A lot of the people who lived there worked in this iron works, and it was there partly because of the canal. So it was 1841, uh, they erected the blast furnaces here, so just 10 years after the canal opened. Uh, it operated until 1902 that it was turned into a uh, Singer Manufacturing Company and operated all the way to 1928. So 1920s was not a good year for Stanhope because two main things, the canal closed down and this big plant closed down. But this was just like Wharton had its furnace and Booten had its, this was what Stanhope has as its main industry. And definitely the canal was a factor in here. So going back to Stanhope Basin now, we see this view is looking west. Um, this is the cradle of Plain 2 West. We'll talk about that in a few minutes because uh, it was right at the head of, the, the basin was right at the head of the plain. It's looking west, you just barely see the Morris Turnpike Bridge here. And today, this is the parking lot of the post office. Looking west, it's all paved. Uh, looking east, rather, I'm sorry. Um, but the buildings are all still there. Main Street building are all the same. Now, um, basins in downtown areas, main purpose of a canal basin is for turning. The boats were 91 feet. The canal was 40 feet wide. So you need a basin to turn. But basins and village areas were used to stop overnight. The canal, uh, canal was open till sunset, <clears throat> closed overnight, and it was closed on Sundays. So overnight and um, on Sundays, you need a place to stop. And this would be a very good place, Stanhope. Because back in the 19th century, Stanhope Village was a very bustling area. Here's a very good photo that shows it. A lot of people, stores, blacksmith shops, and so on. Um, you know, it was a busy place and that was mostly fueled by the canal and by the ironworks. This building here is a stable. So this is likely where the canalers would keep their mules if they were stopping overnight. Here we see a little bit later photo. It has some horses in early autos there. Now, if you were a canal boat captain, you want to like to bend your elbow a bit, you would probably visit this place here. Who knows what that place is? I'm sure someone in the audience does. Stanhope House, that's correct. This is the one place that's been the mainstay of Stanhope from the time Stanhope was founded till today. We saw it way back, 1835 map. There it is, and there it is right there in 2025. It's survived all these years. There it is in its heyday, all done up and bunting. And it has this long, long history. So we look at it, it's 1794, and it's right when Stanhope was kind of starting out. And it's one time, it was a private home, stagecoach, stop, general store, post office, ta tavern, rooming house, and some say a brothel. Now, my experience with the Stanhope house is not as a brothel, but as a blues club. Back in the 1970s, it was a really big, popular blues club. And if you look at some of the names down here, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Muddy Waters, Johnny Lee Hooky, Hooker, uh, Richie Haven, Dr. John, Buddy Guy. These are very, very big names about blues, folk, soul, 
Um, the Nays got big names there. Now, my favorite uh, band was a blues band called the Nighthawks. I saw the Nighthawks here many times, really loved them. And I discovered they were actually a DC based blues band. And then I ended up going to college down in DC. And I saw the Nighthawks down at a, a club in uh, Georgetown. And during the break, I went up to the front man and I said, you know, I've seen you guys a, a few times at the Stanhope House. And I thought he was going to say like, oh yeah, I think I know that. But, but his whole face lit up and he said, oh my God, the Stanhope House. We love the Stanhope House. That's our favorite place to go. So this big city blues band down in DC, <coughs> this was her favorite venue, the, the Stanhope House. So today it's still operating, it's still a venue. Um, I went on their uh, website to see like, okay, they're still getting big names or what. I was very surprised last Friday, a week ago, Steve Forbert, and he's a pretty big name. I don't know if you know him. Uh, big hit, Romeo song, Grammy Award win winner, you know, got radio play. He was playing at the Stanhope House. So I was really happy to see that this was still going strong, still a venue, still um, getting, getting big performers there. Now, back to the canal men. Of course, the canal was right across the street. So the canal captains would have frequented Stanhope House. But according to one book I read, although they did solicit to the canal guys, they had a separate bar out back that they would send them to because they were so dirty and grimy and smelly. They didn't want them mingling with the more genteel guests. So if you were canal men and you came to the store, they'd say, go around back. <laughs> That's where your bar is. So um, that was kind of amusing. Uh, what else do I want to say about? Oh, if you're a, a ghost officiant, if you like to read ghost stories and paranormal, both the Bell Mansion and the Stanhope House are supposedly hotbeds of paranormal activity. So one of the books um, on my big bibliography list at the end, you'll see you know, ghost hunting in New Jersey. They talk about Bell and the Stanhope House. All right, so this, it, these two photos are very interesting. Here we have a uh, 1920s and a 2020s photo taken about 100 years apart. And architecturally, you look at this, it's exactly the same. All the way down the line, all the buildings look exactly the same, no change whatsoever. What's changed? Well, back here, you had cars and people and lots of activity. Today, it's really virtually almost like a ghost town. I took that photo Saturday afternoon, standing right in the middle of Main Street, and it's just nothing. Why did that happen? Why did it become Stanhope become such a ghost town? Well, the short answer is, you know, the plant closed down in 1928. The canal closed down, so that was a factor. But then again, there were a lot of towns where their main, you know, uh, industry closed down, the canal closed down, you know, Boot and Wart and Dover, and it's still bustling town. Why is Stanhope really such a ghost town? Well, we'll come back to that question at the end, and, and we'll provide an answer to that. All right, um, now we're going to cover the second of the two planes, plane 2 West, which is one plane in Stanhope. And, you know, I get a lot of quests. I, I love to study old photos and identify locks and climbs planes. A lot of times people ask me on the internet, you know, Tim, what, which one is this? And it's, you know, simply just a matter of looking at a lot of photos and comparing them and seeing the points of reference. Sometimes the photos are, are labeled. But sometimes those labels are incorrect. So here we have two photos. They're both labeled as the Stanhope plane. This one says plane two west near Stanhope. This says plane on Moore's Canal in Stanhope. One is correct and one is not. Anyone want to guess which one's the correct one? Yes, Joe. Lower right. Lower right. What's the top one? Okay, very good. So our, our president knew this, which lane. <laughs> yes, this is uh, Bowers Town, which is on the other side of Washington Borough. It's 18 miles away, nowhere near Stanhope. Um, what my guess here is that the label said plane seven west, and someone read that, thought it was a two, and they kind of scribbled in two west, and so it was labeled as new Stanhope. This, by the way, is Library of Congress, uh, but it is not, it is plane. This is the one in Stanhope. Now, why do we know that? Well, a few things. Um, first of all, most of you might know powerhouses on the west side had the cupola roof as opposed to uh, sloped roofs on the um, east side of the canal. But the real big thing is 
look at where the uh, photographer is located. He's located right directly over the canal, like he's floating over the canal. Anytime you see a photo like this, where it's taken at a high level right over the canal, you can be pretty sure that it's taken from a bridge. And there weren't a lot of places where a bridge went right over the head of the canal, but Stanhope was one of them. Here we see it, this is the bridge. This was originally called Bridge Street. Now it's called Kelly Place. And we see the cradles just come over the head of the canal, of the plane rather, the boat's about to come in to Stanhope Reservoir. Uh, today, as I mentioned, the post office is sitting in the plane. So this photo, I kind of took my back right against the post office. Um, this is where the head of the plane would be, this building. And we see this house it's right there. So that's a common point of reference that we know, yes, this was definitely Stanhope. A lot of people identify this house as the plane tender's house. It was not, the tender's house was on the opposite side of the plane because it's typically on the side where the flume is since the tender walked down the top of the flume um, to get to the powerhouse. But this is the head of the plane. Um, here we see the bottom of the plane and it went uh, right into crossing the Musconetcon River again. Second time, there were three times the canal crossed the Musconetcon River. When it went across Lake Musconetcon, it was crossing effectively from the, uh, I got to think it's true, to, uh, south side to the north side of the river. Here it's crossing from the north side to the south side and then down at Waterloo, it's gonna cross back to the north side and stay on the north side all the way to the Delaware River. Uh, so plain two west, 610 feet long, 70 feet high, that's average. I have a statistics on all the climb plane. I always look at where it sits. Um, and we see there's Plain Street, which still exists as Plain. There's the Musconet Kong Ironworks over in the right here. And here's an interesting thing. So I said earlier, when a canal crosses a body of water, there's three things. You need a dam, you need a bridge for the mules, and you need a guard lock. So we got the dam, there's a dam there. There's kind of an earthen crossing here. But what we don't have is a guard lock. You see the river goes right into the canal. And that surprised me. I remember walking through here one day and I said, wait a minute, where's a guard lock? You have to have a guard lock. And this is the one place where I noticed there was no guard lock. So my guess is that the river, the dam river and the canal were at such equal levels that they didn't need a guard lock here. My assumption is there was a, probably a gate here that you could open up if you had a lot of rain to keep both the basin and the canal at the right level. But that, that always, always surprised me. There was no, um, there was no lock at this uh, location. Now here's another good view. This is kind of post abandonment, uh, probably. See the, the plane, the powerhouse, ironworks, bunch of houses there and it kind of all looks very depressed, like kind of Stanhope might be on its way out. Um, and there's the creative car kind of sitting there like hasn't seen much action here. Now, this is an article, newspaper article I found, 1876. And what it says is an African-American woman back then, referred to as a colored woman, was steering a canal boat through Stanhope into the cradle. And suddenly the tiller went back on her, knocked her into the water. And she likely didn't know how to swim because it said she would have drowned except for this gentleman who was dressed up in his Sunday go to meeting clothes, it says there on his way to a Methodist festival and he gallantly jumped in and saved the, the woman. So that was, I thought, a very sweet story, but it also showed the um, you know, diversity of the canal. Uh, you know, it was diverse by gender, race, men, women, boys and girls, black and white, all directly work on, worked on a canal and made it uh, operate. And we'll see that diversity a little bit later too. Okay, um, what's there today to look at? Um, not a whole lot. Today we have the, it's still a dam here, so it's still dam, but it's really, really overgrown and swampy. Um, we see Plain Street still there. This is a, a post abandonment cement bridge rebuild, you know, very, very bad corroded condition. And the plane's pretty much gone except for one little section about halfway up the plane and there's this little pocket park and uh, you see a row, two rows of sleeper stones there 
And that's pretty much the only part of the plane that exists today. Um, so if you take Joe's hike, um, you'll see this. I'm going to clear back some of these branches to really overgrown, but um, that's it for plane to west uh, today. But um, yeah, you can see, anyway, you can see how it worked. The Musconuck and the Ironworks would have been over there. Um, and you can cross the uh, bridge here and travel on. Now, technically, at this point, we are out of Stanhope, but I'm going to push on a little bit farther because this area has uh, usually identified as being in Stanhope or near Stanhope. And this is a section between uh, the Musconetgong River and Lock 2 West. You just see the Tender's house in the distance there. And this is a, a very, very good section of trail. And it, best of my knowledge, it's the longest section of watered canal that exists. It's about a half mile from the river to the lock, unless you include the dam push in the Musconetgong River between Saxon Fall and Guinea's Hollow. Guinea Hollow, I think this is the longest, a little bit longer than Wharton. And it's a very nice walk, because it's all woods. It's not developed, so you're pretty much seeing it just as it would have existed 100 years ago. Um, this was a braille trail for many years. They had a plaque there they had. You could see rope strung up here, so if you're blind, you could uh, feel your way around. But that was removed. I think you know the uh, association with the blind or whatever it's called, the term, it wasn't a very good braille trail, so it's not a braille trail anymore. In fact, I just thought it was kind of Ironic, he had to cross this terrible cement bridge with no rail or anything to get to a braille trail, which would not be very uh, safe if you were blind. But anyway, it is, it is, a, good, it is a good section of uh, trail along a water canal. And it does bring you to Lock 2 West, which was known as Flukes Lock. <clears throat> now, if you have Jim Lee's book, Tales the Boatman Told, which was uh, done in the 1970s, interviewed all these different um, canal workers when they were much older. There was an interview with Russell Batson. And Mr. Batson was a laborer on a canal. He went around, did repairs and so on. Um, but he ended up marrying one of the Fluke daughters. And the Fluke family consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Fluke, four daughters. But Mr. Fluke didn't like working in the lock. He worked as a uh, scout chief. So he spent a day on uh, scow boats making repairs along the canal. So he left his wife and four daughters to run the lock. So this was an all-female run lock. If you were a canal boat captain coming through, it would be a lady that helped you through. Yes, please. One that is Louise Fluke. Okay. So this one is Louise Fluke. I hear all kinds of different people tell me who it is, but I'll trust you. This is Louise Fluke. Mr. Batson was married to Josephine Fluke. And what Louise is doing here is using a stick to push open the drop gate. If you don't know how drop gates work, uh, they, you crank them up when the uh, water is at its highest level. When the water is lowered, the pressure on the opposite side keeps that gate nice and snug. Once you raise the water up again, it will fall forward, but sometimes needs a little nudge. So she's using the stick. stick to nudge the stop gate to get it to fall down. So it wasn't a really uh, physical operation. The, the lock was designed with counterweights and so on that anyone could do it. And, you know, like the boat, it was a, a lock attending was a, a whole family operation. We have a picture of Ledgewood of a father teaching a daughter. It looks like she's, you know, six years old how to operate the lock. But the whole Fluke family, so Mr. and Mrs. Fluke, four daughters, Mr. Batson, at least seven, maybe more, all lived in this lock tender's house. And when you come to the end of the trail today, there it is, the ruins of the lock tender's house are still there. So this was a stone house. You look at it, it's not very big, so it's hard to imagine all these people living in this tender's house, but they did. Um, it has been stabilized. You can see the cement here, and that's a good thing, but it is completely overgrown. I, I walked out here just the other day you can hardly see it, it's so overgrown. So, you know, winter is the best time to do it. That's why I shot these photos in the winter. You can actually see the house. Now, the most distinctive feature is this, this arched window here. And it's funny, I hear all these different interpretations of what that is. Um, one I heard recently, which is kind of amusing, they said, 
The Tendu sat here and the canal boat captain got out and passed his tolls through the wind tower. But that's absolutely not true. What this is, is a beehive oven, which you see a photo of here. Typically today, we see these in pizza, uh, pizza parlors. And it basically ovens with fires underneath, heats the stone, and you can cook good, you know, baked goods on top of it. Back then, that was used for any kind of baking, bread, pies, muffins, whatever. So that's how they did their baking here. There would have been a chimney, and you know, this is what, how they would have done the baking. So that we still have the remnants of, of that here. Okay, now that uh, takes us to the end of our journey along uh, the canal, but this path continues on. Just recently, we uploaded the Mount Olive walking map, and that takes you, if you continue west, News Lock 2 East, it'll take you down along Continental Drive. You can visit the site of New Andover, which replaced Old Andover, which became Waterloo Village. And then across the street, you could do the loop trail into Plain Four West, uh, you pass the ice house building at Waterloo and then Plain Full West, you got everything. You know, the plane, the sleeper stones, the tenders, house foundation, the turbine chamber, toy pits, old, uh, very, uh, old um, cable that pulled the canal boats up. Really good site um, that you can go to. Recently, the state park used to be hard to go in, very narrow trail. They've uh, widened it and there were two creeks you have to go across that you had to go across stepping stones. They have full vehicle bearing bridges now, so it's a very good trail. And you have some really good across the river views of Waterloo Village. Now, continuing from Waterloo, heading east, this takes you along the Waterloo Valley Trail, which will take you all the way to Hackettstown. So the one missing link in this whole current Greenway Trail system is the Mule Bridge at Waterloo. Once we get that Mule Bridge restored, if that ever happened, you can hike from Hackettstown all the way out to Lake Musconnect on Stanhope. That would be a great uh, trail system. But currently it's kind of segmented into Mount Olive, Stanhope, and then the Waterloo Valley Trail going to uh, Hackettstown. All right, so let's go back to this question. So what happened to Stanhope? Why did it become such a very sleepy little ghost town? Um, and as I said, you know, of course, the manufacturing plant closed and the canal closed, but that's not the whole answer. The, really, the answer is we have to follow the rails. When the Morris and Essex Railroad was laid in the area, they didn't lay it through Stanhope. They laid it on the other side of the river in the Morris County side. And uh, 1850, 1890, they built this very nice train station here. And what that led to was the development of a different village on the Moores County side. And that was first known as South Stanhope. <clears throat> Today we know that as Netcon. So it, as we moved in the 20th century and Stanhope started to wind down as this big bustling place, Netcon was just starting to develop and it was able to eclipse Stanhope. Two reasons, it had the rail right here and it had the road. Main uh, thoroughfare through the area, which used to be Route Six, now Route Forty Six, goes right by Main Street. So Netcon had the train in the road. Stanhope couldn't compete. What's the canal was going? So it kind of took over as the busy town in the area. So if we look over about a hundred years, going back to the eighteen forty map, Stanhope's just really starting to take off. But here in Netcon, a whole lot of nothing. We got one little lonely house along the and. The, the old road there, jump ahead about a hundred years or so. Look at this, really bustling town of uh, Netcon. Just the people and cars and you know, the rails there and you know, really busy. Uh, today, that's pretty much the same. You go there, Netcon's much busier place. Uh, Stanhope across the river, uh, pretty, pretty quiet and sleepy. Only exception is when you're gonna see, the only time you're gonna really see any really happenings in Stanhope is if someone big is playing at the Stanhope house like Steve Forbert. I really wanted to go out that night and take photos, but it was rainy and lousy, so I didn't. But um, that's the story and that's, that's where we are today. So many thanks to all the people who, all the um, sources I use for this presentation. Um, and I will open it up for questions at this point. So let me start. Any audience uh, before we go to the chat? Any 
audience questions. Yes, sir. What's the level of this uh, difference between the, what the Muscat Hedgehog Lake and Lake Kanakong? What's the difference between um, Lake Musk Kanakong and um, Lake Kanakong? I don't know off the top of my head. The, the answer to that question is whatever the height is of plane one west. Now at home, I have all the statistics of all the planes, um, but I don't have it in my head. So do you know the answer? What, uh, you know, six, six, 60, 70 feet approximately, I would say. No, I think it just over years, it got worn down. It, back then it was all dirt and so on and, and stone. Oh yeah, the question he asked was, did they raise the level of Lake Muscatetcon to cover the towpath? I think it was just, you know, when a canal was in, in uh, service, they were constantly doing repairs on the canal and they were constantly building up the towpath. Once the canal was abandoned, no reason to do that anymore. I think it just kind of wore away would, would be my guess. Yes, you have a question, Joe. When the canal was abandoned, they built a new dam and they raised the lake at that point. They did. Okay. So yeah, I was corrected. It, it was raised a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, any audience, any more audience questions? Okay, Jeff, we have any chat questions? Yeah. Oh, for the. Okay, reading through, uh, one of the comments was there didn't appear to be a basin on the 1835 map. Uh, was it built later? I don't know. Um, good question. Let's see, go back to. <coughs> eighteen thirty-five. Yeah, you're right. There's no basin there. So yes, that must have been let's go to eighteen forty. Yeah, I mean, if we, if we could trust the map, yes, it looks like the basin was built at a later time, probably as the village grew more than there was more of a need for a, a basin there. At this point, there wasn't a whole lot there to stop for, would be my guess. And one other question, uh, what's the source of those 1840 hand-drawn maps? Are they accessible online? Uh, Joe, I think you gave them. <laughs> Whenever I do one of these presentations, I let Joe know he sends me all kinds of stuff, and I go, "Wow, that's great! I'll use it." I, I, do you know what the source is? The first map is, uh, is a collection of maps called the Sykes Collection. The Sykes collection. <clears throat> that's part of the Sykes Collection of maps, and we have a full copy of them. Uh, they were done very early, as you can see, 1835. Um, they don't, well, in many cases, you don't see a lot of detail because there just wasn't a lot of detail along the canal. It was built out into, you know, pretty much the middle of nowhere. It's in places like Stanhope had uh, two small bloomery forges, but not much in the way of, 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 um, of business or residence except for the Stanhope house. And the, um, the second map, uh, is one that we have in our collection. It was copied, uh, hand copied by Brian Morell. Um, and I'm not sure uh, where the original is for that, but it's a, a hand copied map with a lot of detail, um, very handy to have. Yeah, and, and speaking of Brian Morell, he wrote um, a lot of what I learned was he, he did a, wrote a publication about Stan Hope and Lake Muskrat Gong, very, very detailed, very well done. So that was one of the sources I, I use for this. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. how, put it this way, it's hard for me to understand how the canal company could build the canal through a swamp. <laughs> how did they do that? Well, <laughs> very careful. Very careful. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I, you know, it's hard to tell from a map like right. how swampy it was or um, you know, somehow or another, it was you know the ground was good enough so they were able to build a canal and contain it there and uh, so on. So it, you know the problem is the farther back you go, it, it's harder and harder to see just because yeah you know, we didn't have photos back there and we, the maps that were drawn were kind of crude. So you know somehow they they did it. <laughs> 
canal engineers were dealing with all kinds of things. They probably had more trouble building up the towpath. Yeah. You can see that they cut through the loops of the, the river. And probably right. the, 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 those, uh, those loops are probably all, you know, always changing as the uh, uh, <coughs> floodwaters would uh, sweep through that uh, wide basin there. And they had to establish um, a towpath that would define the canal through there. But they got it done. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, thank you all. Came here, thank you, virtual audience. Thank you, Tim. Okay, Great. do you have any uh, last words? Some I'll, closing comments. I'll put it back and I'll turn it back over to Joe. As Tim mentioned, we're going to be doing a tour, um, industrial heritage tour. And uh, there's still some places available. It's a limited, limited uh, attendance. So um, if you'd like to attend and you're not on my uh, industrial heritage list, list, come and see me and we'll, we'll sign you up. It's going to be a great walk. We're going to see all kinds of things. We're going to see all the things that Tim talked about. And uh, I'll dream up some more. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Lots. Not yet. Sometimes we just don't get to it all, you know, right away. It was in the, the, the master list that went out in the spring, but I'll, you know, probably next week, beginning of June, I'll send out an, uh, the flyer for that walk. You're on the news on the tour. Right? Yeah, it's going to be an easy walk this time. No, 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 no four miles this time. Okay, so uh, the Stan Hope walk. Uh, hopefully, you folks are enjoying meeting in person. We like it too. All right. Here. We're going, to, we're going to keep this up. As long as COVID leaves us alone, we'll be trying to meet in person and online as well. And so hopefully, thank you, folks. <coughs> Once again, please consider becoming a volunteer. We really need help at Waterloo. We're going to need help when we develop our programming at uh, the new lock tender's house. We need a lock tender. We need a lock tender's daughter. And we need uh, people to... Help us make this site come to life. Um, <laughs> Jeff's, Jeff's going to be the daughter. No. <laughs> He's not nearly cute enough. <laughs> no, 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 no. <clears throat> All right. Uh, watch your emails for, for events and for, for new information and to uh, uh, learn what we're up to. And uh, with that, have a good summer, folks. Good to see you. Our next meeting will be in September. So watch your emails between now and then. And please join us at, uh, at Waterloo or Wharton or uh, Parkfest. And again, have a good summer. Thank you.